our role. Continuing, verse 4 says, And if the household be too little for the land, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall make your account for the lamb. So that's to, to make sure that everyone had a piece of that lamb. And we're speaking about the first fasica, the first Pesach, you understand, which is the, is, is the principles and, and, and the foundation. You understand, the, the principal foundation is what we need to build on. As Christ um, spoke to the Emmaus disciples in Luke chapter 24, you understand, and it was reiterated that we, we have to begin with Moses as we are beginning, as we continue in our Torah portion, the Rastafari um, sabbatical studies or the Sabbath scrolls. So, verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish. We touched on that fact that the lamb be without blemish. A male, not a female, but a male of the first year. Not of the second year, but of the first year. Now, even this um, symbolic signification has much spiritual and metaphysical import. So just make a note of that as well. Ye shall take it out of the sheep or from the goats. So there's a, there seems to be an allowance here. If one does have sheep, then take it of the goats. And ye shall keep it up until the 14th day of the same month. So that's where the four days, the four days are significant. And the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening, shall dead it in the evening. Not in the daytime, not in the morning, but in the evening. Verse 7, and they shall take of the blood. Now we've touched on the blood already, the blood, according to Genesis chapter 9, verse 4. The blood is life. So blood as an applica application or applicable as an app, a symbol of an app, actually points to the life, right? The life. So they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper doorposts of the houses wherein they shall eat it. And they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire, and unleavened bread, that means no yeast, no yeast in the bread, and with bitter herbs, and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. So this is giving us the basic foundation of what we know as the Pesach or the Passover. The Passover was called the Seder or the Sharat, the Sharat or the Passover order, the order of the table, the order of the meal, the order, the order of the feast. Now, we're going to clear this. Hopefully, you've, you've, you've taken this down. You have this from the last um, lecture right here. For space, we want to clear this. So let's um, take this much down, leave the title up there, um, Fasika um, Pesach. And clear this right here. Now, we touched on the blood before, right? So we understand the blood based on the principle in the scripture. We can document it. So let's document it. And those disciples that come as Amorit, you know, make a note and take a note of it that the blood, Genesis chapter 9, verse 4, is a symbol of life. And just kind of go over that one more time. Um, so you can hear the reading, and this is the documentation, 9 and 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof, shall ye not eat. Shall ye not eat. Now, some may think, okay, this is the, the flesh and the blood, and Christ's flesh and blood, and, and the memorial meal. This is, this is cannibalistic. So when those people are foolish. They are slow to understand to they they can't overstand 
You know, they have a, a spiritual disability. They cannot comprehend, because if you put the scripture in context of scripture, it's very clear. Christ even makes this clear. Yeshua makes this clear in um, John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, um, throughout the chapter, but mainly chapter 6, verse uh, 63. Let's just go to John chapter 6, verse 63. Because that's been a, a, a false, satanistic, atheistic, um, paganistic um, accusation that it's, that it's cannibalistic or something like that. So we want to go a little bit spiritually, um, biblically um, ballistic on it. And 663 says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. It's the spirit that makes alive. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And Christ says in verse 64, but there are some of you that don't admit, that don't admit this, that can't admit this, that are not admitting this. So he recognized, it says, from the beginning, from Bereshit, you understand, from the beginning, who they were that did not admit, did not have Amen, you understand, or imnet, objective or subjective faith, and who should betray, you understand, who should, um, for lack of a better word, snitch in that sense to the Roman authorities like spiritual Egypt, those who are, who are satanas accomplices even in this, present, in this present cycle, in this present time. But it's discipleship that, that's tested by the Timaharit because if you read Furthermore, in the chapter, he's talking about this flesh, the eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood. And some of the disciples found it to be a hard teaching. It was hard for them. They're like, like, you should be a rabbi talking about eating your flesh and drinking your blood. And he explains to them clearly that it is the spirit that quickeneth. So he's speaking to them verbal hieroglyphics. He is using symbolic. It is symbolic. And we find in this in the Passover Seder, or the, the, the Fasika Rat, or Irat, we find that there are um, Misale Yawi, um, symbolic elements, you understand, symbolic elements that are utilized. So it's not these elements themselves, like when he says the cup, you understand, it's not the cup as those who chased around a chalice or whatever like that thing, but it's the symbolism of what the cup signifies, you understand what the cup actually signifies that's important. So moving forward, let's just move forward with this, and we're going to go over this part, verse 7, 12 and 7, where it says, and they shall take of the blood. So we understand the blood is a symbol, you understand, of, of, of life. And it says, they shall take of the blood, right, and they shall do what with the blood? It says they shall take of the blood, verse 7, and strike it on the two side posts and on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat it, where they shall eat the, 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 Passover, the Passover meal. Now, let's look at this for a moment. Um, there is two side posts. Right? So let's do like this. There's this, there's this, there's this, right? There's two side posts, right? And then there's an upper post, right? There's an upper post. We could do a small, there's an upper post, right? And it says that they shall take the blood, right? And they shall strike it. They shall strike it. No, they shall strike it on the two side posts. One, two, and on the upper pulse, look at look, look at the symbolism right there. Look at the symbolism that's created. You understand? And, and we see this in in in, in Tabo Christina in Ethiopia too. This this particular symbol. But this particular symbol, if you look at it another way, you have this. You have what's known as 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 pi. This is known as pi, right? This is known as pi. Now, pi is set to equal 3.14, and then you could go on and on, you understand, with the numbers, 3.14. Now, if we go to um, Revelation, th chapter 3.14, 
or we go to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. What do we have in Revelation chapter 3, verse 14? Now, some of you already know, but we're going to go here again. For practice makes perfect. You understand? 3 and 14. 3 and 14 has a very important word. And 3 and 14 says right here, it says, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God, the beginning of Jah's creation, the beginning of the true God's creation. So the one who's speaking is the Amen. Now, see, Amen is the word that has been mistranslated in your Bibles. Um, from the Hebrew, uh, you know, into the Greek, or from the Greek, based on the Hebrew, amen, or mamen. And, and this is why when it says, to this last church. Now, notice this too. The Laodicean, the Laodicean church, perhaps we should put this up right here. Laodicean church, so it's the amen. Let's put this here. It's the amen. All right, we're not talking about... Um, the false ideas of, of the Egyptian God or those who believe they understand what, you know, they look at the statue or whatnot. They're not looking at the living Amen. They're looking at a priestly character, characterization of Amen that was known to the priests. And now Moses discovered these true, you know, the truth of the true Amen, which is the Moshiach. That's why on Mount Tabor, Christ is speaking, Yeshua is speaking to Moses and Eliyahu. You understand? Because they also are his witnesses. So we have the Amen in Revelation 3.14. Now this is being spoken to the church of the Laodiceans. I think this is how you spell it. It means, it means justice or judgment to the peoples. Justice of the people or judgment of the people. But what's important about this is that this church is the seventh church. The final, this is the final church. This is the end of the church age. Just like right now we are approaching the end. Well, really, we, we've already been in the end of the age, but, you know, the gears, you know, some things cannot be held back any longer. There's been a time of grace, you know, even extended grace, because the Father is a lover of humanity, and he is not willing that any should should perish, but that all should should come to the knowledge of salvation. All should come to the knowledge of the truth, you understand, and to salvation thereby. But Laodicean symbolizes the last church. And to this last church, you understand, the last of the seven churches, it says, these things say it's the Amen. So he reveals himself to this last church by one of the oldest names for God, and that is Amen, the faithful and the true witness, and get this, the beginning of the creation of God. So some words are repeating itself, witness. Last lesson, he says, you are to be my witnesses. You understand? Even in Acts of the Apostles, you are to be my witnesses. So we're to be his witnesses. We're to be called and, and faithful and, and chosen. And then it says the beginning. So we see in the Torah, it says this shall be the beginning of the month, and that was Abib or Aviv, Abib, where we get Tel Abib or Tel Aviv, Abib, which means barley. Abib is the barley harvest, basically. So this is the month in which the barley harvest was, was harvested. It's the beginning of the so-called spring equinox at this particular time. But here's the interesting thing when we connect this with the final age of the church cycle. Remember, it's the end of the world, but it's the end of the Gentile world dominion. You understand? The end of the Gentile, as the end of the church age. And now we have here the seventh church, you understand, is the church of Laodiceans, the seventh church. And when you read and study Jesus Christos, Yeshua, the Mushiyah's his admonition of this church is interesting because this is exactly where we're at right now with so-called uh, Christina or so-called Christianity. It says, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. 
I would. I, I would have liked you if you were cold or hot. Hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. Very interesting, huh? So this particular age is where people are lukewarm. People are lukewarm about religion and lukewarm about truth and lukewarm about everything except about being mindless slaves to Antichrist and this world shits them. But so then because thou art lukewarm concerning the things of God and Christ, concerning the truth, and neither cold nor hot. So it would be better if one say, say they are cold to this. You understand? Or if they were hot to this, then they kind of are lukewarm. He says, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That's, that's, that's Christ. Yes, he's, he's a loving God. He's all that. But he said, listen, if you want to be wishy-washy, I'm going to spit you out. You know, I'm going to spit you out because you're lukewarm. Because thou sayest, Right, thou sayest, I am rich and increase with goods. Isn't this popular Christianity today? Isn't this all these so-called prosperity pimps and pseudo preachers? They say, well, Bible talk about prosperity, so you can help somebody else out. You know, they're in a they're in a sound by gospel, a sound by gospel. Well, everywhere Christ is preached, you know, whether in sincerity or pretense, and, and, and we rejoice in that. But Christ is saying, because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, materialism. Everybody wants the bling bling, even the pastor and the preacher, and have need of nothing. You don't have need of nothing because you're rich. I'm rich, Babylon, you know, right? And knowest not that thou art wretched. So ones are deceived. We're in a self-deceived end-time age. They think that because they got material riches or because God gave them, as they say, a house and a car because they tied to their pastor and preacher and so forth and so on, and he got a nice car, a set of cars and houses and all that. But, but they boast in their riches. Because nothing wrong for a car and a house and all that. But they boast in that when really they should be about the things of God firstly and foremostly, but they're not. They're lukewarm. You understand? And no, it's not. They don't know. Just like the disciples didn't know it was Yeshua that spoke to them. They don't know who speaketh to them. And no, it's not that thou art wretched. You're wretch. You're wretch. And miserable. Miserable. You understand? And poor. And po. They po. And blind. Them blind. And naked, they're naked, they're revealed. I mean, you can see, you can see it. If, if your eyes are open, you see the nakedness. You see how, how, how naked and blind and poor and miserable and wretched they are. Here's what Christ continues to say, verse 18. I counsel thee. Christ is giving them advice. You understand? If we give them any advice, we should give them the master's advice, Adonai's advice. He says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Buy of me gold that already has gone through the fire. Now, gold is a noble element. You understand? So therefore, gold signifies kingship. You understand? In that sense, divine kingship on that level. AU. Well, maybe African Union. Think about it. And that thou mayest be rich. In other words, he counsels them and us to buy of him, to buy of him gold tried in the fire that thou mayest be rich. And white raiment, white raiment, we have to get our garments, brothers and sisters, that thou mayest be clothed. I mean, spiritually and temporal. Remember, this is the age and time where the spiritual blessings and the temporal blessings unite or unite. So, and, and that thou mayest be clothed, right? White raiment that thou mayest be clothed. And that the, the shame of thy nakedness doth not appear, and anoint thy eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, and like to say chastise, be zealous. Be zealous. Have zeal for this, therefore, and repent and turn around. You know what I'm saying? Have a change of mind. You know, and, and hopefully they will hear this message and the other message and begin to think differently before it's too late. See, when it's too late, it's like the game is up. You understand the jig is up. You know, you can't do it. 
you can't do it then. But here's the key thing. The place and the attitude of Christ at the end of the church age. This is Christ, Christ's his, his, his place. This is the position he's taken up. This is the attitude of the Moshi, of the Moshi, of the Moshiach. You understand? At the end of the church. Now, the end of the church age, remember the end of the church age, the end of the nouveau order, seclorum, or the new world order, the Gentiles, the dominion, the whitewashed, white, all this culminates at the same time. It almost reminds me when they talk about the Mayan calendar. A couple of, a couple, they have a couple of wheels that they chart different cycles. But we can see this scripturally too. You understand? That's the end of the church age, and it's also the end of the Gentile world dominion. It's the end of the, the so-called, that's what the financial system is so mashed up too. They talk about they're going to save it. They want to go back to the good old days. What were the good old days for them? That was slavery. Who, who, who are they fooling? Who are they serving? You understand? And who are they trying to fool? But here's the place and attitude of Christos, of, of our black Lord and Savior at the end of the church age. Three verses. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's standing at the door. He's standing at the gate. And he's knocking. If any man hear my voice and open the door, and open the door, open the gate, I will come into him and will sup with him. And he with me. Now, in the teaching of Christ, that's Tawahido, that's Mawahad, that's perfect digestion, you know, perfect oneness, right? Fusion, that's a fusion right there, right? Verse 21, to him that overcometh, not that it's overcome, but to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. You see the connection of gold on and, and the other aspect of the of the parabolic and here with throne. It says, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. This is the interesting thing. He is sat down with the father, you understand, in his in his throne. In Whose throne? In the Father's throne. In his throne. He that hath an ear. He that who spiritually is still sensitive enough, you understand, to perceive this, to receive this, let him hear. Let him shema. Let him shema. Let him shema. Let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Now, this is interesting here. Because it says that this passage is in harmony, the one about um, um, to him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and then sat down with my father in his throne. The footnote here says that this passage is in harmony with Luke 1, 32, 33, Matthew 19, 28, Acts 2 and 30, verse 34 and 35, Acts 15, verses 14 to verse 16 is conclusive that Christos, and this is the footnote right here, this is conclusive that Christ, speaking of Yeshua, Jesus, is not now seated upon his own throne. He is not seated upon his own throne. The Davidic covenant and the promises of God that were through the Nabiyat, the Nabim, the prophets, and the angel Gabriel, Gabriel, Concerning the messianic kingdom await fulfillment. This is interesting because this was, of course, written before 1930. You understand? This was written before the coronation of the king of kings of Ketamawi Haile Selassie. You understand? Before that messianic fulfillment. But it's interesting the note that they give us here as well. So we touched on this pie. This pie, speaking mathematically, you understand, not symbolically of the other kind of pie, you understand, but we're speaking of this pie right here. You see this, this right here? This is exactly now what Exodus, returning to Exodus chapter, let's put this up there so ones can, we're in Exodus, right, Exodus chapter, chapter um, 
12, right? Exodus chapter 12. And at verse 7, right? At verse 7 here, we have, And they shall take the blood and strike it on the two side posts. Bam, bam, right? And on the upper door posts of the houses wherein they shall eat. So this, this will be over the gateway, you see? And when the destroyer, the outfield, you understand? The destroyer, which was called the, the some say it was the angel of, of death. Others are even saying it could well be Nibiru, you understand? Nibiru, a particular uh, pageant, which they say may have last come around, around this particular time of the first um, Fasica, that this protected, you understand, the Israelites' homes. This, this, the blood, but then also look at the pattern. You see the pie pattern right here and the connection that we make with, with the Amen here. And remember, he is also the Amen, Amanuel. He is the Amanuel that God or El or Hila is with us. Now, even to the end of the age, and the church of the Laodiceans represents that seventh church or the end of the age. So this connection here has to be explored a little bit more. But this is symbolically the pattern, you know, saying that when the Atfiu or the destroyer passed by the Beta Israel homes, saw this particular pattern and configuration which forms the pie, it, it passed on because the pie symbolically, you know what I'm saying, is symbolical, symbolical of the Amen. And this Amen, you know what this Amen is also called? Uh, hallelujah. I almost, almost didn't, didn't put it together right here, but thanks be to the Holy Spirit, you know what I'm saying, the Amen is also called the golden, right, mean, ratio, the golden mean ratio. Now, it will be a little bit much to go into all the mathematics of the golden mean ratio and the metaphysics of the golden mean ratio, but what we find to be very interesting is the fact that this golden mean ratio, you understand, has gold. Remember he says, buy of me what gold that's tried in the fire, you understand, and gold is a how can we say gold is a a noble? Gold is called a what? A noble. You understand? A noble element. It's a noble L. You know, it's a noble element. It's also on a periodic chart. It is called AU. You understand? And the AU, if you want to go a little bit further, the AU, you understand, equals the alpha and the omega. The AU also equals the awo, you understand, in the Ethiopic, which is the affirmative, you understand, which is actually an affirmation. Now, we can connect that awo, awo, amen, you understand? Awo and amen basically is one and the same, but we'll touch on that as well. So if we even follow this a little bit, Further, we can see certain connections, not just to make the connection, but, but is there a sense that is scriptural principle that's implied in this connection? Not just making a connection, but is the connection expanding or clarifying the basic truths, you understand, that we know and we can verify? And yes, this is right here. So we thought this was interesting when we had read this portion just a couple of moments ago. Well, probably a couple of minutes ago, and we want to go into it a little bit more. Now, the next part, verse 8, it says, And they shall eat the flesh in the night, not in the day, in the night, right, roast with fire, unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. With bitter herbs. Now, there's a there's significance to all those elements. Make a note of it and, and, and search it out, study it on your own, and hopefully when we have opportunity, we'll get into some of the, the meanings of, of um, you know, such as the unleavened bread has a particular meaning. Um, 
as well as the bitter herbs also has a particular me- meaning. And you'll find that find certain basic elements of that contained in some of the Jewish seders, the Jewish, the Passover seder. So you can look that up. Um, there's a lot of information, basic information, that I think is, is very necessary for us once lost but now found. Verse 9 says, eat not of it raw. Don't eat it raw, nor sodden at all with water. In other words, don't eat it raw. You know, it says not quant, uh, whatever like that. Don't eat it raw and don't sodden it with water. You understand? Know but roast with fire. Roast it with fire, head, his head with his legs, and with the pertinence, you understand, the pertinence thereof. Verse 10. And ye shall let nothing of it remain until morning. In other words, you're not going to leave a portion. I, I, I'll, I'll have this later on. No. Nothing shall remain until the morning. And that which remaineth of it until the morning, ye shall burn with fire. Whatever remains of it shall be burnt with fire. Verse 11. And thus shall you eat it with your loins girded. This is what was very interesting. It says, how shall we eat it? How are we going to eat it? With our loins. You understand? With our loins girded. You understand? With our loins uh, our loins tied, our loins girded, in other words, like with our belt on, you understand, or even with a, a, a shash, you understand, girded around our loins. The loin is actually the back of the, the back of the, the small of the back is where the loins, it's not really the, the that's the groins, the groins on the front, the loins on the back, like if you look at sirloins, if, if, if you are or were a meat eater, you might understand that. So it says that we shall eat of it. You understand? It tells us how we shall eat of it. It says, um, and thus, like this, shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, hmm. and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. You know what I'm saying? You shall eat it in haste, not lay, let's lay back and lounge. No. They, they, we shall eat of it with our loins girded. You understand? With, 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 a, with like a girdle, or with our loins girded, with our shoes on our feet, with our staff in our hand, and we eat it in haste. So symbolically, you understand, e- even for the Lord's sup in haste, right? It is the Lord's Passover. It is the Lord's Yahweh, Jah's Passover. Verse 12, For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods, all the Elohim of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord, or Ana Anoki Yahweh. And the blood shall be to you for a token, for a token upon the houses where ye are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. Now, there's every likelihood, you understand, that such a spiritual smiting occurs in the end times. We know this from Revelation. It talks about the vials. It talks about the plagues. It talks about what will, what will come down upon humanity at that end of the age, when the culmination of these things are. This is why the Lord's meal, Adonai's memorial meal, you understand, is very important. The bread, the wine, the communion, you understand, the fellowship, you understand, in spirit and in truth is very important. Verse 14, so this is a memorial, metasebia, of redemption by blood. 
and this day shall be to you for a memorial. So it's telling us that this day, you understand, the, the, the 14th day of Nisan is a metasebia. It's a memorial. And what do we do for memorial? How do we memorialize a memorial? We, in our memory, in our minds, in our hearts, in our minds. So it's spiritual, it's metaphysical, it's on a consciousness level, mainly as well because he tells us it's a memorial. It is something that we think about. It is something that we meditate on. It's something that if you remember something, you don't forget it. So you remember it, you don't forget it. So it's a, it's a spiritual thing. You understand? He says, be not conformed to the world, but be transformed by the what? Renewing of your mind. Keeping this memorial helps us in and assists us in that renewal of our mind because we are keeping a very important memorial of Adonai. And ye shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. Then say, okay, you can stop after. No, throughout our generation, ye shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Now, by an ordinance means that there's a certain order. You understand? It's not do what you will. You understand? No, there's a certain order which is acceptable because there are principles even spiritually. You understand? Whatever we bind up on earth, you understand, we bind in heaven. Whatever we loose on earth, we loose in heaven. You understand? We seal this up on earth. You understand? Therefore, it is sealed, and we are sealed in the heavens. So there's no need to fear the, the plagues, the mechsephet, you understand, of the spiritual Egyptians and, and Sodomites. Verse 15, it says, seven days, seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread. Even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. Now, in the first the first fascica, this was actually this was they, everything that is leaven, everything that has leaven in it was removed from one's gates. You understand? Now, leaven. When we study and document this further in the New Testament, leaven was always, in a sense, used uh, symbolically as a kind of an evil agent. Leaven. You know, because what leaven does, it puffs it up. You know, puffs it up as, as an evil agent. So leaven, often you'll find in the New Testament, symbolically is connected with that, with, with, with wickedness. Now, we find this in, uh, let's just go here. Let's give you the documentation on this as well. When it talks about um, the leaven, the leaven right here, um, it was about... Christ our, Christ our Passover. You understand? Christ our Passover. Let's get this one over here. Christ our Passover is slain. In fact, I wanted to share this with you, brothers and sisters. This is the old concordance here. But sometimes in some of these books, they have some simple but very accurate. It's like bullet point. And every, every you know, it's very, very simple. It's, it's not like a lot of, like here, it breaks it down right here. And the, the, the scripture I wanted to, to give you is 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 5 and, 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 and 7. 1 Corinthians 5 and 7. Let's see if we can put this, see if we can hold that up there. Um, 1 Corinthians, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay, here we are, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Um, let's just, uh, it says, uh, purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Purge it out. Remove it from your houses. You understand? But now, remember, that was the Old Testament dealt with the temporal. You understand? You could say the material. On this level, it firstly, is the spiritual that's important. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Or that was physical. This is metaphysical. That ye may be a new lump, for ye are unleavened. For even the Moshi, 
our Passover fasikachin is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven. Now, get this description, verse 8, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Neither with the leaven of malice, not with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity, being straightforward, sincerity and truth. So that also gives you an example, a kind of an example of how leaven, leaven deals with evil malice in that sense, or that which puffs up, that which glories over that which there's no glory, you know, like, like self-righteousness, oh, I'm so holy, I'm holier than that, you know, that kind of nonsense. In fact, our, our righteousness you know what I'm saying? It's Christos. Our righteousness, our black Lord and Savior. He is our righteousness. It's not, it's not in ourselves or because of so-called good things that we think we do. Don't delude yourself. Do good, but recognize that it is, it is Christ. It is, it is John's son. You know what I'm saying? His spirit leading and guiding you and give him the glory. So this is what First Corinthians is trying to prepare our hearts and minds and those who fellowship to come to the gathering, come to the feast, and to hold the feast in the right spiritual state of mind. You understand? Because there is a judgment if it's not in that right state of mind. You understand? And that judgment is not child judging you, but you brought it in a sense, as they would say, on yourself, because as a man thinketh, so is he, and so if he sows these, these, these sort of thoughts, don't come to it with the proper mind state. You understand, know like the disciples, they witnessed all those things, but still they were sad because they were foolish. They didn't have the scriptures. They, their understanding wasn't open to them. The eyes, they wasn't seeing what was really in front of them. They didn't recognize, you know, understand, the truth. And basically they were, they were victims of the first sin. You know the first sin was, right? Ignorance. That's, that was the first sin. It was ignorance, not knowing. So it says, and this day shall be to you a memorial, and ye shall keep it a feast to Yahweh throughout your generations. You, throughout generations, you shall keep it a feast by an ordinance, a seda, a surat, a shirat, forever. Seven days shall ye eat unleavened bread, even the first day, the, even the first day ye shall put away leaven out of your houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. That soul is cut off from Israel. Now, we could go into some detail on what does that mean, the soul being cut off from Israel. I mean, it's like the lost sheep. The lost sheep, their souls are cut off from Israel. They don't know that they're Israelites. You know what I'm they think they're niggers and coloreds and African Americans and all kind of other strange Gentile names and other stuff. They, their souls are cut off. Their, 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 their consciousnesses, you understand, their psyche, their psychology is cut off from, they, they don't know themselves, in other words. So, because, see, by eating the leavened bread, during this small period of time, seven days, is a willful act of disobedience. So if you're amongst this, this is, this is, this is almost a spiritual cutting off. It didn't say that anybody will cut them off, but their soul, their psyche would be cut off. You understand? You know, they would be like, in a sense, psychopaths. You know, and, and, and we, unfortunately, there's many that that we find on the in the trot that become kind of because they're doing their own thing and they're not making their wills obedient to good influences, but yet they are seeking to carry that name and to walk in that way. And then such a thing as that, you know, saying, well, why are you gonna eat the leavened bread? Uh, eat unle it's just a it's just seven days. You know what I mean? That soul because they're not in. They have they have broken the like the ethernet, the spiritual ethernet in a sense, you, you, if, if you can receive it. Verse 16 says, and in the first day there shall be a holy convocation. So the first day, 
is, is a holy convocation, or some even call like a high Shabbat, Sabbath, or Sendet. And then the seventh day, there should be a holy convocation. So this kind of further proves what we said right here. When we look at these two letters, Alpha, Omega, and we do the math on it, right? You understand? We basically have one, right? And we have seven. You understand? The first, the Alpha, the Omega, the first, in that sense, and the last, when we base it on that seven, you know, on the seven, on the seven seals, let's put it like that, or the seven spirits, on, on, on that seven, or the seven which compose, we can say, the Elohim, you understand, or some came to the elemental, the elemental Elohim. So it says, no manner of work shall be done in them. So one could... Could one work in the days between? It doesn't say you can't. Should one work on the first? No. Should one work on the seventh? No. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat. Save what you must eat. So even there the Almighty is, is giving us um, grace in that sense. That only may be done of you. Only that which you must, in a sense, do. But going out, trying to, the, 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 the profitable stuff, you understand, to make a profit. We have other days to make a profit, you understand? You know what I mean? Um, to bang the economics that we need to get to the next level out of Babylon. But during this time, you understand, we should keep it set apart from other times. This is keeping it as a memorial. So keep this in mind. It's a memorial. Remember it. And ye shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For in this selfsame day have I brought your armies. Get that. You brought our armies, our host, out of the land of Egypt. I've called my son out of Egypt. Therefore shall ye observe this day in your generations by an ordinance, by a and, and orderliness, we can say, by an order forever. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even, in the evening time, because see, the, even, the evening begins the day. It's for us as Hebrews in the ancient world, the evening and morning. So that's why it says at, uh, in, the, in the first month, on the 14th day of the month at even, ye shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your house. That's symbolically saying no malice and no wickedness. For us on the metaphysical or spiritual level in the Hadith Kidan, no malice or wickedness. So, it is a good opportunity to rise, you understand, above your 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 fleshy, you know, your fleshy self and, and, and your worldly self and that self that has to be polluted by the world to make ends meet, do what you gotta do. This is an opportunity to to think higher things and to receive also the Holy Spirit and to receive to download from above because of your obedience. Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, be cut off from the machiber of Israel, from the, from the unity, you understand, the machiber, from the society, the association of Israel, whether he be a stranger, so it's not just for the, for, the, for the native sons and daughters. He could be a stranger, let's say a foreign, a Gentile, or born in the land. Or he could be, or they're born in the land, or if they are Beta Israel, you know, say the Jew or the Gentile, in other words. Ye shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. So don't try to go to somebody else's house and say, oh, I didn't know they had some. See, it's a small thing, people would say. Well, we can still eat it, but why should we? And if we can, we should try to clear the leaven out of our houses too. 
You know, I mean, one could try to stretch the grace, but don't be like Satan if you can. If you can remember not to, don't fall from grace. All right? Okay. So, um, verse 21, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. So the lamb now becomes the Passover. This is like what we have in um, 1 Corinthians 5 and 7 for Christos, for Christ, our Passover. So Christ becometh in our Seder, the Moshiach, the Messiah, the Lamb of God, becometh our or is our Fasika, Fasika Chin, Selenia. Because of us, he is he is sacrificed for us, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssops and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lentil and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until morning. In other words, it's not like after you have it, you're going to go clubbing. Now, notice something. Um, Judas, he went out. Didn't he go out? Judas was dismissed, but he went out, and then the Bible will say, and then it was night. In other words, then, then, then like the evening, in other words, came, and he had went out. You understand? He went out. You know, he should have understood what was said here, but he went out because he was going out to, to betray. But he is saying that strike the lentil. So this is the lentil. The lentil will be this one here and the two side posts. So this is a very important, um, we could say, uh, glyph image, kind of hieroglyph, symbolic logic, much symbolic logic is contained. For Yahweh will pass through and smite the Egyptians, as in this time the spiritual Sodomites and Egyptians are going to be smitten. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, when he seeth this symbol, which is pi, when he sees this symbol, you understand? This is also symbolic of the way the, the tabot in Ethiopia is carried as well. We'll hopefully touch on that a little more. But when he seeth this symbol, you understand? When he seeth See if the blood upon the lintel and the two side posts, Yahweh, the Lord, will pass over the door, will pass over the gate. You know what I'm saying? Will pass over the gate and will not suffer. And he, notice this, it says, he will pass over the gate, you know what I'm saying? Protect the gate, and he will not suffer. It says here in verse 23, the destroyer, the destroyer. The at feel to come into your houses to smite you. He will protect that gateway. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons and to thy sons forever. To, to the lijoch, to the sons forever. So for us as dekamez amor, as disciples, as as lidges, as sons, this is very important for us to learn it and even teach it, if possible, if Yah wills, to our sons and daughters. But the sons, you understand, have a responsibility in the kingdom that is unique to them and that is protective even of the honor, you understand, of the household, especially the mothers and daughters. And it shall come to pass when ye become to the land which Yahweh will give you. So notice something. We, we are like them. We're not even in the land at this present time, 2012, in a land which Jah, which the King of Kings and His Christ has given us. But it says that when, you, when it shall come to pass, it's not saying, oh, that'll never happen. What? You know, why are you troubled? Why are you sad? You know what I'm saying? It shall come to pass, and it shall come to pass, when ye become to the land which Egeziavihir Lotus Subhat, the sustainer, will give you according as he hath promised, 
that ye shall keep this service, that even when we get in the land, we keep this, what does it call it? Service. This is our reasonable, what's it? Service. This is, this is too, and especially is a agelagalot, a service or a ministry. You understand? And it shall come to pass when your children shall say to you, what meaneth ye by this service, daddy? You understand? What meaneth ye by this service? Like, in other words, what does this, this thing that you'll do, you understand? What, what, what does this mean? See, this is also in modern um, um, Jewish uh, Judaism. This is something that's part of the Seder, you understand, where the child asks, and what meaneth ye by this service? It's, it's incorporated actually into, you could say, the Seder which is very good in a sense because then the children get to partake. They get to act, and that ye shall say, verse 27, it is the sacrifice of Yahweh's Fasika, which passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. The people did what? They bowed the head and they reverenced and they worshipped. Verse 28, And the children of Israel went away and did as Yahweh had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. So did they. Now, the contest with Pharaoh. The war between what well, was Rastafari and Babylon ain't over. You understand? So the contest with Pharaoh, even the spiritual Egypt, Pharaonic, Masonic, Freemasonic, Illuminati, um, Shiat, it still goes on. But it's the tenth judgment now. It's the tenth judgment. It's the death of the firstborn. The death of their ear apparent. The, you know, the one whom they would pass the chains of our enslavement to their to their children. You understand? Know, kind of reminds me of black black men and women in the South that had to kind of care for Masa's children, and they had to call like the little child Masa this and Masa that, so forth and so on. It's like that sort of firstborn. On a certain level, you could almost see Nat Turner symbolically in in in, in that same kind of in the smiting, in a sense. In, in other words, how significant that smiting of the firstborn was to Egypt then, just as it is and will be to spiritual Egypt, Egypt now. Now, it goes on. There's two more, two more parts of this. And it came to pass that at midnight... Yahweh smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. I mean, you know, sometimes we might read this, but just think about how significant something like that in real time is and will be. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve Yahweh as ye have said. Yeah, but why you refuse? Oh. Yah, Jah hard in your heart. He went on to say in verse 32, Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone. <laughs> it says it right there, and be gone. And bless me also. That, that's the part that's trippy. He says, be gone, like as you said, as you said, and be gone. And then he says a little last, a little last, um, a little P.S. in a sense, and bless me also. You know what I mean? Because he recognized that the gods that he was serving was not the true and faithful Amen. Because the true and faithful Amen was with the Beta Israel. 
and the Egyptians were urgent upon the people. They were urgent. They were like, come on, get out, get out, come on, hurry up. And they, that they might send them out of the land in haste. They wanted, now they wanted the Beit Israel out. For they said, we be all dead men. We be all dead men. Sound black. We be, you understand? Not we are, but we be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. I mean, you have to really get a visual, if you could get a visual, a visual of this. Verse 35, And the children of Israel did according to the word of Musa, and they borrowed, really, that, that word borrow really should be like asked or sought. You understand? And they, they asked of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And Yahweh gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they lent. It says lent, but actually it should be gave. You know, that, that little tricky thing in the mistranslations. But the Schofield checks it as much as it can. And they gave to them such things as they required. So Kodesh was about to leave. They needed certain things. And he asked, and the Egyptians say, hey, what you want? You want this? You need that? Please, just, just, just go. And they spoiled the Egyptians. You see, maybe that's why they try to play with the economy right now, because they know that they're supposed to be spoiled in the same way. You understand? So it wasn't a monetary thing so much. You understand? But it, it was just part justice, part recompense. It was only what was right. The redemption, the second stage of redemption by power. Now, this is the first stage of the journey. And from verse 37 to 51, this completes this particular chapter right here. And let's just get into this so we can complete this and probably go over another teaching or lesson on this, which will take it like we're going stage step by step and different, touching on different aspects of it and then going in different degrees of the teaching from the basic foundation, you understand, there is general education, special education, and then there's the higher, the higher education level and summary. So let's just go through this right here, redemption by power, the first stage of the journey. And the children of Israel, the Geek Israel, they journeyed from Ramses to Sukkot. Sukkot, remember Sukkot is one of the, the three um, high holy days for the Beit Israel, but it was also a place, Sukkot. It means booths. Almost you can call it like shanty town in a sense, called booths, temporary dwelling or huts, so to speak. About 600,000 on foot that were men besides children. Verse 38 says, And a mixed multitude went up also with them. So in addition to the Beit Israel, there were countless other folks. That, that came out, you understand? So in addition to, to, the, to the seed, you know, the, the, the direct descendants of Yaakov and Abraham, Yishak, and, and, and Jacob, there was a mixed multitude that went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough, which they brought forth out of Egypt. For it was not leavened. Even at this time, it was not leavened. Because they were thrust out of Egypt. They were pushed out of Egypt. They were like deported, you can say. And could not tarry. Neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. So they couldn't really make certain preparations, you understand, because of the rush. Verse 40, now the sojournings of the children of Israel who dwelt in, in Egypt was 430 years. Was 430 years, the sojourn. And they don't say the, the enslavement. You, you know, there's a lot of folks that be saying that. No, it's talking about the sojourn, how long they dwelt there. You understand? In good times and in bad times. That's what it's talking about. Verse 41, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day came to pass that all the hosts 
of Yahweh went out from the land of Egypt. Where it says host here is basically armies. In the Hebrew, it's uh, Sebaot. Sebaot. Like where it says the Lord of uh, Sabaot. The Lord of uh, Sebaot. You understand? Which means armies. Bamarinya Sarawit. Right? Um, they went out of the land of Egypt. Verse 42. It is a night to be much observed to Yahweh for bringing them out of the land of Gibbet or Gibbet. This is that night of Yahweh, of Jah, to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. And Yahweh said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance, this is the order of the Fasika. There shall no stranger eat thereof. This is interesting. And there shall no what? Stranger eat thereof. Verse 44, but every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. Verse 45, a foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. A foreigner, one who's a, who's a foreign, and one who's a moyatenya, a hired servant, not to eat thereof. No, they, they have to become a member of the family. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh abroad out of the house. You're not going to, like, I'm going to take you a piece of the fire. No, uh-uh. Neither shall ye break a bone thereof. Now, this is interesting when they talk about neither break a bone, because if you connect that with John chapter 1936, 1936, that was, uh, that was a good year, though, a fateful year. John 1936, you understand, speaks about how Christ's bone on the cross and the crucifixion was not broken. So that's the connection right there, because they'll say, as it was written. And if you don't have a good Bible, you might not find out where it was written. But that, that matters. Verse 47 says, all the congregation of Israel shall keep it. All of the congregation. So speaking to the, the machiber, the congregation, the society of Israel. And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, and will keep the Passover to Yahweh, to Jah, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land. So even though he's a stranger, once he meets the qualification, you understand, of membership in the Beit Israel, and this time it was concerning the circumcision. Now, is there a role for that? Yes, but the details is another teaching. You understand? For no uncircumcised, uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. You see, the big controversy concerning circumcision, you know, in early Christianity because of misapplication of, of what and when this is talking about. You understand? And, and the, the Jews who, who, who argued with Paulus, Paulus, Paul wasn't saying no circumcision because he's saying, I'm circumcised. We as basic Israel are circumcised. But you're telling the Gentiles the only way they can have salvation in Christ is to be circumcised, and that's not what Christ said. You understand? But what they were looking at is the fasica, you understand, from the Old Testament to eat of it in the Old Testament, but not overstanding the New Testament fulfillment. That's just a, a, little, a little portion of it, not to go too much into detail. But there is equality. Verse 49 says, One law shall be to him that is homeborn. So there's one law to him that is homeborn, and to the stranger that sojourneth among you. Thus did all the children of Israel. And it was like this all the children of Israel did it. As Yahweh commanded Musa and 
Aaron, so did they. Verse 51, to complete the chapter. And it came to pass the selfsame day that Yahweh, that Jah, the Lord, Adonai, did bring the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their armies, by their Sebaot. Because each, remember how everyone, every, every house had a, had a father or there was a, the houses of the fathers. So, and there's like 12 tribes, you understand? And then besides the, 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 the ethnic Hebrews or, or blood beta Israel, there were other peoples, there was people they married, there was in-laws, there was servants, so forth and so on. So each one of these, and, and even in a tribe, there were camps and camps. They were like organized units, you understand, amongst those. So when we talk about the host, we, we really need to spend some time on looking at the scope of it. But when we understand the scope of it and the context and how it was done then, we recognize how it's going to be done even in this day and time. If one's want to talk about repatriation, Fasica is the key of repatri of sustainable, of ja sustainable repatriation. And the reason why we're still in the situation that we're in is because it's like ones are cut off and ones are blind or not recognizing what his word or not receiving him in good faith. But if we do, and if we will, before it's too, too late, you understand, we shall see the salvation.